Praise the Lord. This is Fast Elders for the Global Evangelistic Ministry. So glad to be here with you. Welcome to another Sunday afternoon. We're so grateful to have you here with us online or those that are here with us in the house of God. Amen. Let me go to a word of prayer and then we will find ourselves, giving ourselves completely over to his word. Heavenly Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. We're asking, oh God, God, that even as we're going through your scriptures, God, we want to do you justice. We want to do right by you, God. We want to rightly divide and share according to your will, God. I pray that the simplicity of your word will go forth and the understanding will be made plain that the people will hear, receive, and understand what it is that you desire to do at this hour. And we say thank you now in advance. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. I'm so glad. Um, uh, last week, we actually we started out uh, expressing that this is a gospel summer. I pray that this will cause some of you all to be hooked, amen, like a good TV show, amen, that, that, that every, every week we end with a cliffhanger and you're ready to come back to see what's happening next, amen, uh, that this is the place that you desire to be at this time because it is what God has desired to share at this time. Even I want to, uh, so uh, again, you may, uh, there's some things that I said last week that you may hear. Again, there's some things that may be stated, um, and, and I just want to bring about clarity on some things. Last week, I actually stated that uh, it was within 20 years, within 20 years that Jesus, uh, after the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, that they began to write the scriptures. I want to uh, strike that statement. I want to make a correction and say that it was between 35 and 40 years. Hey Amen. I had went back, looked at the tape, listened to what was said, and it was it was somewhere around between 35 and 40 years in the way that they calculate uh, the um, the writing of the gospels, the writing of the gospels. Hey Amen. Uh, and so it, again, it is believed that Mark was the first author. And then uh, possibly after it would be Matthew, and then it would be Luke, and then John writes later. He writes later. John writes later after uh, the writings of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Amen. And so last week we actually talked about that uh, Jesus was in the beginning. Amen. Uh, it's, it's amazing because. Um, during uh, the time of during the time of Jesus' birth, uh, what would have been taking place in that time was the Jewish people would have been praying for the coming of God's anointed one. They would have been praying for the coming of God's anointed one. Uh, they would have been praying for the Christ. They would have been praying for the King who would lead them to victory. That's what they were praying for. They were praying asking God for the anointed one. They were praying, they were asking for the Christ, the King, they were asking for the one who would lead them to victory over their, over their oppressors. Now, the way that they saw this was quite different uh, than what God did. And, and that shows us sometimes that when we ask God for something, he doesn't exactly give us what we want, but he always gives us what we need. He doesn't always give us what we're asking for, but he does give us what we need. And so what he did, what, what ends up happening is, is uh, the Christ that the Lord said he was born in a stable. Uh, he, was into, he was born into a working class family. Uh, and he was, he was never destined to wield or to lead a military army or take a political stance of power, right? Uh, because they were expecting the Christ, the King to come to actually lead them into battle, to, to either take political power over their oppressors. They were looking for the Christ that would come to be someone of, of a, a higher wealth status to actually come in. And Jesus was born in a stable. He was born to an ordinary mother and father, everyday people. Um, and, and he never... Uh, he never was, uh, it, it was never his goal to, to take on politics or, or anything of that nature. In the Christ that had showed up, he had a spiritual power. 
that was so powerful, his, his focus and, and the intensity of what he was doing, it made earthly problems, earthly power seem petty in the eyes of God. That, uh, that in God's, God's view of power is very different from ours. Amen. How God sees power and how we see power is two different things. Amen. That, that God is sovereign. He's in control and he knows what's best. He knows how to do what he must do in order to get things done. And oftentimes when we try to take on power, when we try to lead or to, to encourage, sometimes we want things to happen quickly. We want it to happen fast. And sometimes we might use force. We might use force, we might use intimidation, we might use fear, right? Because sometimes it's hard to get people to agree on the same thing at the same time. To be in complete agreement, to be in complete harmony, to be in complete what we call unity, it is complicated. Because now you gotta convince, you gotta talk, you gotta rally, you gotta lobby, you gotta gain people's uh, trust, right? And, and, and I keep hearing this, that you can't make everybody happy. You can't please everybody, right? You keep hearing that. And, and if you're looking to come into this type of power, sometimes with what we have, we have to, we, we seem like we have to do this or we have to do that or we're going to take it by force. And, the, and that's what they were desiring. They were desiring somebody to come in that would actually lead them and guide them into the power that would no longer cause them to be oppressed, no longer to, to cause to be uh, uh, what, what, what it would appear to be second-class citizens. Uh, you, you, had, uh, you had people living in a time uh, where there was violence, there was things going on, and as a group of people, as a group of people, they still were serving. They were still servants. And they was looking for a king to come, to overthrow. Now you gotta remember the time that Jesus was born into, right? Uh, what time, historically, was Jesus born into? He was born into the time of the Roman Empire. He was born in that time frame. And so in that time frame, Rome was the leading superpower. Yes. They were the ones that were in charge. And the Jews are waiting for a king, the anointed one, the Christ. Who, who was the king that was anointed and, 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 and literally God used them mightily? King David. King David, he was, he, was, he, he was anointed king. He was the anointed one that was anointed king at a very young age. He defeated Goliath, remember? The, the, the enemies, the, the, the Goliath comes and says, hey, he's talking stuff, and, and now uh, we're looking to see uh, what's going to happen. The children of Israel, the armies of Israel, they were nervous and afraid. And God uses a boy, anointed, who later becomes king. They was waiting for that type of situation to arise again amongst their people. They were waiting for a king to arise that was anointed and willing to stand up to, to, to their oppressors and to those that would actually not give them the opportunity that they thought they should have. But we thank God that God does not always give us what we're praying for, mm -hmm. but he gives us what we need. Amen? Yeah. That Jesus came and he came as, as, as a man. He came as one that would actually come and set his people free. But his kingdom was far greater. Amen. So we, we go into John uh, last week. We uh, we began um, to look at that, that that John, he actually spends uh, the first five, uh, first 14 verses of the book uh, expressing or, or considerable amount of the first 14 verses of the book expressing that Jesus was in the beginning. Right. Remember, we talked about it last week that, that John, he, he carefully chooses his words. He carefully 
uh, speaks and says what is taking place. He, he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And, and every good Jew, every Jewish uh, uh, hearer would actually agree. They would be nodding their head in agreement. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And they would be agreeing, agreeing, agreeing because of the fact that they knew that God spoke with his word in the very beginning and things were created, everything was formed. And then he says this, and the word was God. Then he goes on and says, and the word was God. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And in verse 14, he says that, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, we, we went through it last week. We began to talk about that. We recognize that he's talking about Jesus, and he was, he was encouraging them to, to remember that Jesus goes back further than any other genealogy. Why would John do that? That that's, I want to encourage you that when you begin to study your Bibles, begin to ask your scriptures questions. What does this mean? Why is this going on? And then begin to read. Remember last week I said that scripture interprets scripture. You want scripture to actually speak for itself, right? And so that's how we want to use scripture. We don't want to, uh, uh, we, want to we want to try to allow scripture to speak for itself, right? And so John, why would John go all the way back to the beginning to say that, that, that Jesus was part of the beginning of beginnings. That Jesus is God. Well, uh, uh, one of the things that I want to I want to say to you is, is that Matthew, each author, each author of the gospels, they wrote for a particular reason. I think we talked about this as well last week. And, and Matthew, he proclaims, he's actually talking about Jesus, but he proclaims Jesus as king of the Jews. He's writing to the Jews and he's proclaiming Jesus to be king of the Jews. Mark, he writes this intense gospel where, where it's for those that, 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 that don't got a lot of time, but you, can, you, you, you want to take it in and get to the point. Uh, literally, he writes this intense gospel uh, uh, like an action movie that, that literally uh, scene by scene, play by play, uh, uh, that literally you're getting a chance to see everything up close and personal quickly. And, and uh, Mark, he writes concerning Jesus being a suffering servant. Amen? Amen. Luke, he, he writes in detail. He he, he, he goes out like a reporter, like an investigator. He, he gathers witnesses and he talks to other people and he talks to family members and he finds out who was related to who and how did this work and how did that work and, and more educational wise, like for the purpose of understanding, Luke goes out, but he's presenting and proclaiming Jesus as Savior of all. Amen? He's, 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 he said Jesus is Savior of all. And John, we tell we, we we said last week that John proclaims Jesus as God. Jesus is God. So now we get an idea that as you're reading through these gospels, you'll be you, you have a backdrop that literally that, that Matthew, he's saying that Jesus is king of the Jews. Uh, uh, Mark proclaims that Jesus is the suffering servant, and he's and Luke is saying that Jesus is Savior of all, and John is saying Jesus is God. Amen. We we want to we want we why, why is it necessary to go that far? Well, well, let, let me let me take a little time because let's go to the genealogy of Matthew because Matthew actually takes time to actually go into and now genealogy what it is is it's the family tree. All, the only thing that's really being displayed is his family tree to say that this is who he's related to. Right, because because there were prophetic words, there were things that were spoken, there was things that were said that this is how the Messiah was going to come, this is how the Christ would show up, this is what he would look like, and this is what things would take place, and these are the things that should happen when he came about. And so, uh, uh, what ends up happening is he writes a genealogy, he writes his family tree. Uh, Matthew, 
uh, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. He starts out, this is the genealogy, or this is the family tree, or this is, these are the people that are connected by family to Jesus, the Messiah. The son of David. Amen. The son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Amminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Solomon. And Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Amen. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, and Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jeroboam. Jehoram, Jehoram, uh, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jokaniah, and his brothers at the time of exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shiltiel and Shiltiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abihu, and Abihu, the father of Elikayim, and Elikayim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Elihu, Elihu, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Matthew, Matthew, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there were they called from Abraham to David, 14 from David to exile to Babylon, and 14 to the exile to the Messiah. Matthew gives the genealogies of Jesus to Abraham. Amen. Now, you can tell as I was reading those, I practiced a little bit. Because <laughs> those names will get you tongue-tied or twisted. Amen. Amen. But what we begin to see is, is that, that Matthew, he's, he's, he's actually declaring Jesus to be king of the Jews. And he leads him all the way back to the founding father before the Jewish nation was formed, before the Jewish people were formed, which is Abraham. Amen. And he, and he begins to show that he's part of the bloodline. He's part of the grouping. He's part of the, the ancestry of the people. Let's, let's, let's see. Come on, let's go a little bit further. Luke also gives a genealogy as well. Luke chapter 3, verse 23 through 38. Amen. Luke chapter 3. Verses 23 through 38, Luke also gives a genealogy of Christ, Jesus. It says, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought of Joseph, the son of Heli, uh, the son of Matthew, the son of Levi, the son of Mel Melchi, the son of Janai. The son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, whom Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, Math the son of Matthias, the son of Sim, Simi, the son of Joseph, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonah, jo, Jonah, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shit. Sh Sh Shealtiel, the son of Nerai, the son of Mel 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 Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kasam, the son of 
Elm, Adam, Adam, the son of Er, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Jorim, the son of Matthias, the son of Levi, the son of Simon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, Eliakim the son of Meliah, the son of Mena, the son of Matthias, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Solomon, the son of Nashon, the son of Amenadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Surah, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalel, the son of Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Luke takes the genealogies back to Adam. Pastor, why are we reading all this? What is this about? Well, some of, some of us may never read this ever. <laughs> It's so I'm reading it in your ear because oftentimes this is the stuff that we want to skip through because it seems like it has no real purpose, but it has a great purpose because what is happening, what is actually taking place is, is that uh, 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 Matthew, he leaves Jesus' family tree. He leaves his family tree all the way back to Abraham, the founding father of the people of God, or the Jews, right? He leads them all the way, he leads the family tree to say that he was part of this family. He was part of this group prior to now. Luke goes further and says that we can go past Abraham and go all the way back to Adam, the Garden of Eden. That Jesus was kin to Adam. <laughs> that was his great, 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 right? Great, great grandfather. He was kin to Adam. But John says, we can go back further than that. <laughs> Jesus was not only part of the heritage of the families that came up, but he was in the beginning. He was with God, and he was God. That's why we're taking this time. That's why we're taking this time. Because, it, so these, uh, when we're looking at all the genealogies together, right? Everything that's said. So, so, so John is careful what he's saying because everybody was agreeing. Yes, 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 yes. In the beginning it was the word. Yes, yes. And the word was with God. Yes. Right? Then he says, and the word was God. Yes. Amen. To, to say that Jesus is God. So now what happens after this? Uh, today what we're going to do is uh, we, I want to I wanna help us to, to understand sometimes when you know the characters that's in it because I, I, I want to encourage you and listen to you all. The assignment that I gave is read the first three chapters of John. Amen? Read the first three chapters of John. If you want to follow to figure out where we're going to be at next, read the first three chapters of John. As you read through what's going to happen is you're going to hear us talking about it. We're going, we're going slow. Right? Talk to me slow. Right? I'm going slow. We're going slow. And, and that's why I don't know if we're going to make it through the whole everything by the end of the song. But what we're going to do is we're going to learn something and we're going to grow together. Amen? Amen. 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 And so what, the, some of the main characters in this gospel, what are some of the main characters in the gospel? Uh, well, Jesus is the main character. Right? He's the main one that you look, you can look to see. You're going to see a lot about Jesus. You're going to hear a lot about Jesus. You're going, to, you're going to learn about his life. You're going to learn about his childhood. You're going to learn about his teenage years. Somewhat. You're not going to learn about everything. There's a, there's a, there's a group of years that, that are not here. 
and, and people say that there's other places that you can outsource them and go get them from, I just say stick to the 66, y'all. Stick to the 66 because, because if you go somewhere else trying to find out as teenagers, you say, well, you, you actually get information from other places. I say stick to the 66, right? The Bible is very careful what it says, what it does not say. It is very careful of what it talks about. And so there are other books that other people have written that actually talk about the different years of Jesus' life, of, from his, of his teenage years. But my encouragement is to stick to the 66 because what ends up happening is the Bible shows us a, 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 a quick a, a quick overview of his life. We see him as a baby. The next time we see him, at what age? What is the next time that we see him? 12 years old. And that will become him actually coming into his bar mitzvah. Coming into his young adult, his manhood, his right. So at twelve years old, we see him again, right? So you see him as a baby. They don't they don't take us through all the steps of how she nursed him and how he played at the park and what daycare he went to and who he hung out with. Literally, it takes us from a baby Jesus and what happened at his baby. And we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna go into all of that. What what took place? Is that see his his the Lord has a way of announcing. And pronouncing what he's doing. God, it's not no secret. It's not no secret. So as a baby, when he showed up on the scene, it was one man who was actually looking to kill all the babies that were the same age as Jesus. Because he was looking for Jesus. It was another, it was another, uh, it was wise men that came out. They said, we saw a star and we follow the star because we're going to see the king. Right? They brought gifts that were fit for a king. They, they actually came and they, 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 they honored him, right? Uh, there were people in, in the Gospels as we go through that said that I've been waiting my whole life to see you. Now I can go home. Uh, 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 people gave up their lives to times of prayer that it would come to pass that Jesus would show up on the scene. And so all these things have taken place. And so you got to know who, who are the main characters in these Gospels when you begin to read the Gospels? But the main characters or the main people that you're going to see when you actually go through the Gospels, you're going to see Jesus. I want, to, I want to make this distinction right quick because I think it's very important for us to know because I think sometimes we think that there were so few and there were so many. You're going to see his disciples. Jesus had 12 disciples. Yes? Yes? But those are considered his inner circle. There was 12 that walked around with him. That was the group that was with him. They knew Jesus. They knew him very closely. He knew them very closely. He was sharing with them what the gospel is. He was sharing with them his teachings. He was sharing with them his life. But Jesus had multitudes of disciples. There were a whole lot of disciples. And, and, and when he left, he left the work of sharing and teaching and training to those 12. And those 12, they began to teach and share, and others began to teach and share, and it began to grow. But he had multitudes of disciples. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a passage in the scripture that you begin to see that John, the disciples of John the Baptist actually come to Jesus. And they come to Jesus after John the Baptist passes away. And they all believe Jesus because of the fact they believe John. Jesus had multitudes of disciples. So it was not just a few disciples, right? And we're going to talk about the disciples as well. So, so now you got the main characters. You got Jesus. You got his 12, right? That we always hear about, the ones that we know about. Then you got a bunch of people that are following Jesus at the same time. You got a bunch of people that follow Jesus at the same time. Then you're going to see another individual that you're going to see in all, in all of the Gospels. You're going to see John the Baptist. John the Baptist is in all of the Gospels. John the Baptist was the forerunner. He was the one that actually opened the door. We're going to talk a little bit about John the Baptist today uh, as well. Amen. John, John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus. Who? Uh, so then... So then, uh, and, and, and what we begin to see when we first see John the Baptist, we begin to see John the Baptist, and we see John the Baptist and his disciples. That John the Baptist has disciples as well. 
And later they actually become disciples of Christ. Amen. Amen. Who are some of the people that Jesus touched in the Gospels? Because, that, you know, it's like some things were happening, some things were going on. Who did he touch? He touched the sick. He touched the poor. He touched the rich. He touched the sick. He touched the poor. He touched the rich. He touched the lives of the people. He was the, the people that were that were drawn to Jesus were, were oftentimes the poor. Why? Because sometimes it's easier for the poor to receive the gospel of good news. Because those that have oftentimes think I got enough. But the gospel was not limited to the poor because the rich even followed Jesus. He touched sinners. That's all of us, right? Touched sinners. He was talking to sinners. That's who he was dealing with. He was dealing with sinners, right? He was, he was dealing with sinners, those that had rebelled against God. One of the, one of the simplest definitions of sin is I rebelled against God. Anything that rebels against God, that's sin. Anything that goes against God's will, that's sin. That's one of the easiest ways to think of it. When anything that goes against God's will, anything that rebels against God, that's sin. Right? Anything that God don't want you to do and you do it, that's it. So he talked to sinners. He also talked to religious groups. He talked to the Pharisees. He talked to the Herodians. He talked to the Zealots. He talked to the Sadducees. These are different groups of people with different beliefs. They're relig religious and they're all a part of the same uh, uh, group of people. But they, but they have different beliefs. And, and so therefore, these are the people that oftentimes, that you begin to see that oftentimes came against Jesus. You say that Jesus was here, and they, they came, and they wanted to trick him. So they was asking him these questions. These are religious leaders. These are, these are religious uh, leaders that actually come against Jesus to try to trick him, to try to find out, to try to see how he's going to handle the situation. There's many instances that we'll talk about as we go through. I, I don't want to, I'm trying to take it slow. <laughs> My mind is like thinking about all types of stuff right now. But, but the reality of it is all these people, they, 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 they came to Jesus. And Jesus was not, he was, he, what am I trying to say? How can I say it? Jesus was Bible smart. He was Bible smart. But Jesus had wisdom. He, knew, he didn't know how to, he knew more than just quote scriptures. He had wisdom. There was an instance where they literally, they called Jesus out. I got to bring it up because it's in my mind. It won't go nowhere. I got to talk about it, right? Uh, there, 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 there was an instance where they bring the woman out. The woman, she had been caught in adultery. She had been caught in adultery, and they bring her out, and they throw her before Jesus. Now, the Bible don't say that they dressed her up, and she was well-dressed and, and put in the right position. So I, I would only imagine with my imagination that they brought in a sheep. They had her wrapped up in a sheet, and they bring her before Jesus, and hopefully they brought her like that, right? And they say, this woman was caught in adultery, Jesus. What should we do? How should we handle this situation? What should we do about this woman? Because this woman was caught in adultery. Now, being as that they didn't bring the man to, Jesus could have brought that up, but he didn't say nothing. He could have brought up, where's the guy? Right? That, that's where's Where's the guy? Here's the woman. Where's the guy? She was caught in adultery. Where is the other individual? The Bible says that, and, and, and it doesn't say what he writes, but the Bible says that Jesus, he bows down and begins to write in the dirt. We don't know what he wrote. A lot of people got a lot of ideas of what he wrote. But we don't know what he wrote, but he bows down, he begins to write in the dirt, and when he gets back up, he looks at the people. And now, if you can imagine the people, how they were set up, the people were set up that they knew that they were going to bring this woman to Jesus. 
They knew that by right, the woman should be stoned. So before they brought the woman to Jesus, they went and got their bricks. They, they, they got their bricks, they got their rocks, and it was all ready to stone the woman. And they're standing there waiting to hear what Jesus is going to say. Now, this is why I tell you Jesus was, he, he was smart too, right? Because they had gathered their rocks, they was trying to trick them. The woman had really did what she had did. And instead of him saying anything, he, he bows down and gets her right on the ground. Then he comes back up. But this is where the trick really was. They already knew by the law of Moses that she should be stopped. That's the law of Moses. That's the law of scripture. Right? But they also knew by the Roman law. They also knew by the Roman law. That's like me talking about, I know by the law of scripture what's supposed to happen. But I know by Chicago law. Right? If I do such and such, I'm going to be in handcuffs. You hear me? They knew what would happen if he actually pronounced and said, let's go by what Moses said. She's supposed to be stopped. But they also knew that he would be convicted. Jesus would be convicted for starting a riot. And he would be incarcerated. What does Jesus do? Instead of saying, yes, I agree. Oh, no, I don't agree. What he does is he bows down on the ground. He begins to write in the ground. He gets back up and he says, he that is without sin cast the first stone. The Bible says bricks start dropping everywhere. <laughs> bricks start falling on the ground. <laughs> the Bible says the old people left first. <laughs> And then the young. That we have to be wise. You got to know God's word enough so you know what it's saying. You got to know what's going on around you so you know what's happening. And then you got to be able to say, Lord, give me wisdom. So he can tell you what to do in that moment. Because what he tells you to do in that moment could be the difference in life and death. Not just for you, but also for those that are around you. When he began to talk about he that is without sin cast the first stone, they drop their stones. They drop their rocks. They drop. Why? Because everybody be dealing with some sin. Forgive me, y'all. I know I'm online. Right? But the Lord knows how to heal us. The Lord knows how to keep us. The Lord knows how to prevent us. We don't have to deal with sin on the basis that we're dealing with it all. We don't have to deal with sin as much as we're dealing with it and how we're dealing with it because of the fact that when we begin to line up with God's word, doing sin becomes less attractive. It becomes less desirable. When we actually begin to line up with God's word, sin no longer looks as good as it used to. It no longer feels as good as it used to feel. It no longer has that draw that it used to have, right? So, but but the reality of it was, he said, he that is without sin, cast the first stone. Everybody recognized, I am a sinner. They dropped their rocks and they left. It not only saved his life and his ministry, but it also saved the life of the very one. Then he asked the woman, where is your accusers? Where's the folks that said that you're wrong? I, I don't know. What did he tell them? Go and sin no more. Amen. That's what repentance is. 
Repentance is, is that I was actually, I was, I was actually moving in the direction of sin. I was living in this way. And I was going through this and, and, and whatever I was facing it, and, 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 and you come to a place where you have an encounter with God. And, and, and now you say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe you. And I'm going to, I'm going this way, but I'm going to turn this way now. Because sin is that way. I know it's that way. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you. I'll believe you. And I'm stop walking that way. I'm going to walk this way. I'm going to walk with you, Lord. And I'm going to go and sin no more. That we make a decision to intentionally, on purpose, we make a decision to intentionally, on purpose, decide that I'm not going to sin anymore. It's a choice. It, sin is a choice. I don't want to. I will not. Right? Lord, give me the strength. Lord, help me. I'm going to go and sin no more. And that's how we begin to live our lives. Every day we're saved and we don't have to worry about hell fire, that we going to hell because some Christians, they always scared that I'm going to mess up. Maybe I'm going to mess up. Maybe I'm going to get it wrong. Maybe I'm going to do this. Maybe I'm going to do that. I remember last time I tried this before and it don't seem like and we be, we be scared like that and it's saying no more. You don't have to feel like that no more. You, you can be confident that I'm saved. And I'm saved why? Because God saved me. Because I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. When I accepted him as Lord and Savior, he changed me. Everything didn't go away all of a sudden. Everything didn't disappear right away. But he changed me. He made me different. Something is different. I don't know. I can't explain it. Right? My, everything still, some stuff still looks the same. But, it, but I'm different. Something, I'm different. Something is different with me. I don't know. Something is different on the inside. And the more that I grow with the things of God, the more that I grow in the ways of God, then God is going to continue to cause me to become stronger in the Lord. I'm going to become stronger in the Lord. Certain things I'm not going to do. Certain things, certain things when I do it, I'm not going to feel good. I say, man, what's wrong? I used to do that. That was that was all right. That wasn't no problem with that. But now, no, oh, that ain't right. I don't know why. And you really have to push past your discomfort. You have to push past your, your willingness of your decision to do right to actually do wrong. Because God begins to empower us to be able to live a righteous life. To be able to live a holy life. Right? And so we, we begin to see that this is what the Lord is doing. That there, there are people. There are people in the Bible. We're going we're gonna to begin to see the different people that, that show up in the Bible. There are different people that we're going to see in the scriptures. Now when you begin to read it, you, you hear these funny names and you try to figure out who they are. You have an idea. Hey, I know who they are. That's them people. Pastor was talking about it. That, that's who that is. That, oh, those are the ones that was trying to trick Jesus. Oh, those are the ones. That's what's, that's what's happening. And it becomes a little bit more clear. And then when we begin to see, and next week, you, you gotta, you, you got, y'all gotta stick with me. I want y'all to read uh, chapters one, two, and three of John. Amen. John chapters 1, 2, and 3. Amen. Because next week, what, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about Jesus' cousin. Amen. We're going to talk about John the Baptist. How we're going to begin to see how the Bible is, 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 not, uh, uh, is not shy of certain things. As a matter of fact, when we begin to look at the genealogies, when we begin to look at the family tree of Jesus' family, we begin to see that everybody was not kosher. Everybody was not nice people. But yet and still, they made it to the family line of Jesus, that Jesus was a part. Amen. And they were in his family. That, that, that they were people that at times were not so good and became better 
as they went along. I love the Lord because he don't see us like other folks. Sometimes folks give up on you. They don't, nah, they don't, uh -uh, not them. The Lord don't see us like that. He don't deal with us like that. As a matter of fact, he sees us that we're perfect in his eyes now. Because through Christ's blood, we find ourselves perfected in the eyes of God. And we have to daily make a choice. Daily make a choice. Sometimes moment by moment, we make a choice. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I am going to do this. Right? Sometimes you start feeling like, I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm too tired. I'm, no, 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 I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. I think we have to rise to the occasion. We make choices. We have choices. Amen. And so we begin to see that that what, what took place was is that uh, they're, they're, they're expressing different genealogies. They're expressing the family lines. And they're, they're going back to say, this is who Jesus was. And this is where Jesus uh, began. Amen. And they're actually expressing uh, to the people that they're encouraging. They're encouraging him that he is king, that he is savior to all, that he is uh, that he, he, he is God, and that he is um, amen. I'm trying to think of the last one. That he is He's a suffering servant. Amen. That Jesus is a suffering servant. Amen. At this time, I want to pray for those uh, that have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Will you pray this prayer for me? I believe that when we pray this prayer, the Lord will minister to you. The Lord is going to uh, speak into your heart and he's going to encourage you that he is everything that you have need of. Will you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus please, forgive me please forgive me of all my sins. All my sins. Lord, Lord, I believe, I believe that, you died that you died and rose again. And rose again. Lord, Lord, save me. Save me. I, receive I receive my salvation, my salvation now. now in Jesus' name. Let me pray another prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is going forth. I thank you, oh God, that you're calling us, oh God, to choose. To choose not to sin. To choose to live a life that you've empowered us to do. You've, you've given us the power to live holy. You've given us the power to live righteous. You've given us the power, oh God, to be a people, to honor you with our lives. We believe you for it. We receive you for it. And we thank you, Lord. We honor you all the days, Lord God. God, I pray that you'll be with us, oh God, in our homes. I pray that you'll be with us on our jobs, at our schools. Lord God, wherever we may be, I thank you, oh God, that you are with us. And I pray that your hand is upon us. I thank you, oh God, that as you have anointed Christ, God, that you would anoint us, oh God. Anoint us, oh God, to be able to do what you've called us to do, Lord God. And we receive it now, God. We say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I want to encourage you to please like, share. Uh, and, uh, and we look forward to being back with you all again.